Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Imperial College London and to the 2018 Vincent Briscoe Lecture. Uh, my name is Ian Wormsley. I am the provost here at Imperial. Before we start on the introduction to the lecture, I wanted to just say a few words in tribute to my predecessor as provost, Professor James Sterling, who retired last summer and sadly passed away last Friday. Many of you here will have known James personally, and indeed he presided at this lecture on a number of occasions. As well as being an outstanding physicist, James was an important and cherished member of the Imperial College community. I'm sure you will all join me in sending our best wishes to Paula and his family. Moving to tonight's lecture, it is the ninth annual lecture from the Institute of Security Science and Technology, or as it's known locally, ISST. We're very creative here in terms of acronyms. <laughs> ISST is one of our six global challenge institutes formed to address some of the most important challenges facing society today. It celebrates this year its 10th anniversary, and I'm delighted to see that it's going from strength to strength under the leadership of Professors Chris Hankin and Bill Lee, continuing on, on its mission to serve as a trusted interface between research, government, and industry, and really pioneering what we can do in security science at that interface. ISST is an inter influential voice in government and has led a number of vital national programs, such as the Research Institute in Trustworthy Industrial Cyber Physical Systems, we could probably well use with a good acronym for that, uh, which is a UK-wide program investigating cybersecurity vulnerabilities in the crucial na national infrastructure. This year, the Institute will start an MSc course, its first, in security and resilience. It's now open for applications, so if you're looking for an extra degree, please line up over there with Chris. Uh, and thanks again to Bill and Bill Proud and Jane Lack for their efforts in setting uh, forth on this important milestone for the Institute. A key part of the Institute's work is engaging with policymakers and the public, and that brings me to tonight's lecture specifically. It is one of the most eagerly event, uh, anticipated days in our calendar, and this evening we are very fortunate to have such an esteemed speaker to continue the history of the lecture. The event always co covers a topic of real public current interest and brings together a very diverse and impressive group of people to, to comment. The Vincent Briscoe Lecture Series carries the name of a distinguished Imperial College scientist, professor of inorganic chemistry here between 1932 and 1955. Uh, professor Briscoe worked on a number of problems and particularly ones related to heavy water, methods of determining deuterium in small samples, uh, sort of thing that never goes out of fashion. He apparently also had many other interests, including, uh, 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 including a knowledge of London streets, which, according to his obituary in the Times, would not have disgraced him as a ta taxi driver. Uh, unfortunately, another outmoded uh, device now that we all have GPS. Importantly, he's recorded as providing very first scientific advice to the fledgling security services during the First World War, and he continued that service to the country throughout the interwar years and into the Second World War. As the official college history notes, much of Briscoe's work was secret, and it is still unclear exactly what he did. <laughs> we are absolutely delighted tonight to welcome the Commissioner of the London Metropolitan Police Service, Cressida Dick, and I'm delighted to hang, hand over to Chris Hankin to introduce her. Welcome. So, uh, good evening. Uh, so Cressida has uh, 34 years of public service, the majority of which she spent in policing. 
She held leadership roles in each of the organizations she's worked in, which include the Metropolitan Police Service, the Thames Valley Police, the National Police College, and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. She's overseen a wide variety of high-profile and complex policing investigations spanning serious and organized crime, security, and protection. In February 2017, Cressida was appointed Commissioner of the London Metropolitan Police Service, taking up the role in April 2017. She is a former president of the British Association of Women Police and has a master's degree in criminology from Cambridge. Tonight, she's going to deliver a lecture to us entitled Digital Policing, the Changing Role of Technology in Law Enforcement. And I'd now like to invite Cressida to come and deliver her lecture. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for uh, that warm welcome. Uh, as some of you will know, I am not a scientist, I am not a technologist, I am not a lawyer, uh, I'm not an academic, um, I'm not even actually, despite what some people might think, a detective, I'm certainly not a proper one by, by Met standards, um, and I'm definitely not geeky. And I am lucky, therefore, that I know I've got some geeky police friends scattered undercover in the audience should I get a particularly hard question, and I'm relying on them, Mr. Dyson, Commissioner of the City of London Police, not to ask me <laughs> any difficult questions. <clears throat> but given that I am none of those things, uh, I am extremely honoured uh, to be uh, the Vincent Briscoe Lecturer this year. Uh, I am, as you said, honoured also to be the current Commissioner of the Met, and uh, I'm here as somebody who's been a police officer uh, on and off uh, since 1983. And I began policing on foot patrol uh, in the West End of London then. The world was a very different place. But when I go out with my teams now or sit next to my call handlers speaking to the public, I'm often actually struck by how, my, how very, very little the core purpose of our work has changed. People need us and rely on us to help them at the worst of times, in true emergencies, to protect and save life, to prevent crimes, to investigate them when they happen, support victims, bring people to justice. We keep the peace, we uphold the rule of law. We're expected to do this fairly and impartially, and we are required to use our exceptional powers sparingly and only when necessary in a proportionate manner. Our proud tradition is one of policing by consent, upholding people's rights in a diverse, modern, liberal democracy. And we rely on a high level of trust, on visible presence and face-to-face -face interactions with our citizens. I loved policing in 1983, warts and all, and I love it now. But I have to say that if the core purpose, the mission, the rhythm, the excitements, the sadnesses, the heart of policing, our ethos has actually not changed very much, and I do believe that. The service, what we used to call the force, has in fact been transformed uh, in many ways. We are so much more accountable, we're so much more scrutinized, we're so much more responsive and transparent. We are very much less secretive. We are very much less arrogant, I think. We are more humble. We are much more diverse. Uh, and we are much less, but not as much as I would like less, uh, hierarchical than we were then. We are so much more professional in a multitude of ways. Levels of skills and specialisms absolutely unimaginable when I joined. The integrity of our evidence, the relative, and we must never be complacent about this, but incredibly low levels of corruption. I could go on. And of course, to tonight's lecture, just about every aspect of our work has been transformed since I joined by technology and uh, advances in communications. 
So let's start just by thinking about crime detection and investigation. And this is what I, I started with, the typewriter with the carbon papers. We had to do three to get it on the police national computer, which did actually exist. My favorite car, actually that's just slightly before my time, but not much because I drove one as a student. Um, the, the new fangled radio, the fingerprint of course, still very enduring and invented a long time before. But I talked um, just recently to a detective inspector uh, who was at West End Central with me in 1983 and I asked her, and actually interestingly it was a her, a pioneer, how she investigated homicides. And the one word she used was, first of all, slog. Everything was a slog compared with today because everything was on paper records and we had to deliver things by hand and cut things out of newspapers and that sort of thing. But also that although there was some scientific support, of course, at a crime scene and one could reconstruct maybe how a fire happened, it was so very, very limited. And what went on in the Met Laboratory was similarly extraordinarily limited. And actually they relied on witnesses and lots of clever sort of inferences and arresting somebody and locking them up and sometimes locking them up for quite a long time. Uh, go, go back in your cell and think about it under the judge's rules and confessions. And of course we now don't rely on confessions at all. I mean, occasionally people do confess to us, but we don't rely on them uh, uh, by themselves ever, or, uh, or any, in fact, in effect, in court, in any meaningful way at all. So fast forward to today, and a senior investigating officer, which I am not, would be considering a whole list of possible strategies uh, involving technology as soon as one of those ghastly homicides which we have had in London in the last 10 days has happened. That's the sort of thing that they'll be thinking about. And I could blow any one of those out to a whole enormous range of different opportunities which the senior investigating officer will have, which need, need to be used sparingly, of course, on occasion, but led in a sensible way as they go through the investigation. And if I just focus for a second, I'm not gonna blow it out, but just on forensics and biometrics, just think how much has changed there. When I joined, we didn't have DNA. I think DNA technology was invented, began to be invented in 1984. It has utterly transformed the way we do uh, crime investigation. And then if we think about data, most of the other uh, uh, categories there are data categories. So if we go on to the next slide, um, you can see just how much an investigating officer has potentially at their fingertips, and I'm not expecting you to, to read all of those, uh, but there's that and actually much more uh, potentially available. And these are available not just for a homicide investigation, but in various ways for all sorts of, uh, all the other aspects of our police work that I described earlier. So where we are saving lives, which my officers do every day of the week, whether that's in a hostage negotiation situation, whether that is emergency life saving of somebody who's been stabbed, whether that is finding a missing person who is about to collapse. They will be using technology, they will be using data. Safeguarding children, protecting BIPs, preparedness for a mass casualty incident or a terrorist attack, all utterly transformed uh, by technological opportunities and using many and more, in fact, uh, sources of data like these. So technology gives us the most incredible opportunities in 2018 to identify more offenders, to intervene before crimes are committed, to locate fugitives and, as I've said, missing people, prove associations, motivations, and so forth. And importantly for me, technology gives our evidence greater integrity. It gives us greater legitimacy in many ways and the hazards of unfair trials or miscarriages of justice or corruption in the system, the whole criminal justice system, have been reduced so very much by uh, the use of technology. You'll all be aware also though, that of course, uh, with technology there's always an obverse and uh, it's also changed criminal behavior uh, incredibly and criminal opportunity. So we have seen, as you all know, a recent explosion of, in new forms of crime, 
such as cyber, simply uh, impossible uh, not so very long ago. Arguably, and I suppose there's a fine line here, we have also seen perhaps an even greater explosion in traditional crimes, the crimes that the old laws understood, and I understood as a 1983 police officer, but those traditional crimes being encouraged, incited, enabled, or hidden by technology. Think of, uh, just for a second, it's not a pleasant thing to think about, but think about indecent images of children. In my day, you could, of course, go and get a magazine, probably somewhere in Soho. Now, uh, there are hundreds of thousands, millions of those images around. We, in the Met last year, 36% increase over the year before, had uh, over 2,000 referrals of crimes to investigate. And in fact, that is just, of course, the tip of the iceberg of people who are viewing uh, such images. And we now know that even more Appallingly than that, uh, child abusers are live streaming abuse on occasions using technology from one side of the world to another. Online harassment, hate crime online, grooming for sexual exploitation. And let's just pause for a second also to think of something horrible, the extraordinary impact that Daesh has had as a, as a terrorist uh, movement. Uh, so much effect through uh, communication and advanced use of the internet and uh, technology more generally. So, and this will be a familiar phrase for some of you, for me the challenge for a 2018 police chief is to try to make now and in the future technology and data more of an advantage to us than it is to the criminals to the bad guys. And of course, as a police chief, I'm charged of doing this in a way which has to be effective, it has to be efficient. We've got to make good choices about priorities and, and uh, how we go about things. We have to do it entirely on a sound legal basis. We have to be ethical and we have to take our public with us. We have to have the support of the public. And right now, all of policing and certainly the Met is undergoing, as so many other uh, institutions and organizations are, enormous transformation programs. At a time uh, when our spend is uh, highly constrained, we, and we're not unique in this, have some massive and creaky legacy systems. I know this is not exclusive to the public sector. This is true of many, many sectors that we have to replace. Our data is neither as clean or as organized or as accessible uh, as we would optimally like it to be. Meanwhile, the pace of change and the volumes of data are increasing dramatically. And in some respects, they're becoming much more complex for us to find and handle. And I'm going to argue also in this lecture, but it is an <coughs> argument, uh, that the law and lawmaking processes are struggling to keep up. And that's actually right now far too little debate about policing ethics in this changing world. I was struck, some of you will have been here, some of you may have seen it, Michael Chertoff speaking last year said about cyber, which I'm not going to talk about, the big challenges are not technological. They are policy, legal, and ethical. And I think to a great degree the same is true for us. So I'm going to try to exemplify a little bit more about our current context and where our capabilities are. I'm going to say a little bit more about our recent advances and some of the challenges, what we are maybe doing quite well, where some barriers are, and I'm going to ask for your help or many of your, your help. I hope, despite some of the things I've said above about the challenges, that you will detect that I, and I am absolutely not unique in this, my police chief colleagues and police officers up and around the country are actually very excited and optimistic about the future for uh, policing uh, in, the, in, the, in the data age. So let's just for a second, if, if I may, talk about volumes. In 2005, uh, you will remember the ghastly attacks in London, enormous investigations into the 7-7 attacks. Uh, we seized about 400 exhibits. Uh, there was a total of about four terabytes of data. In just one of many hundreds of our CT investigations this year, we have imaged uh, 81 terabytes, although I'd have to say the norm is, is, is lower than that, certainly much lower than that. 
you will be familiar with the degree to which, you know, adults, 90 odd percent in this country have a smartphone. The average London household now has 10 data storage devices, I'm told. One device might contain 50,000 data items. Most crimes have a digital element and a huge proportion of investigations require accessing personal data stored perhaps in a multiplicity of locations. Criminals communicate across multiple encrypted platforms, often simultaneously making identification and analysis of relevant content extremely challenging. Now I know that in the audience here there will be some people who say 81 terabytes, what's that? And what they mean is it's small compared with what they have to deal with, probably. Not, what is it, Ian? Um, it, it's small for some people. But the point is, for us, we're not so worried about volume, although that is a challenge. We're very worried about complexity. And uh, the reason for that is, is, is multifaceted. But one reason is... The internet has created a completely different relationship between victim and offender in, in so many crime types. Previously, crimes might have been committed most commonly by people who knew their victims or lived quite near them. Now, of course, so many crimes have multiple offenders, different places, different jurisdictions, sometimes multiple victims, also different places, different jurisdictions, data, different places again. Data complexity also arises for us because of the sheer nature of the data we look at. And I think it's worth looking back at that if you can see it and the questions that we ask of that data. So as police officers, we are required to deal with an exceptionally broad sort of scale of data, as you see on the slide, from financial com communications to digital media, third-party data of one sort or another. And al almost no matter what the category, I think there's a public expectation that we should be able to identify, receive, and exploit any data that, that informs our ability to safeguard the public. Of course, that is actually not, in this data age, completely realistic for us, but that might be an expectation. And we find that the data that we're seizing comes in so many different formats because of this range, but also, let's take CCTV in London. Everyone always says there's more CCTV in London than anywhere else in the world, and it's probably true. Our challenge is that some of it is state-of-the-art and some of it is archaic and it comes in 2,000 different formats that we have to ingest. Uh, I could give you other examples. Sometimes the question that we're going to ask of our data can be quite simple. Can we identify a telephone number, an IP address, a specific image? But more complex questions are things like, do we hold anywhere in that data, something that undermines the case for the prosecution. So-called exculpatory material. So not incriminating, but something which would, but that would actually go to show that somebody is innocent. And that can take any form, uh, most topically and very challenging in terms of volume in interpretation and complexity, is where there's previous communications between suspects and victims or, or where third parties suddenly uh, also are communicating with one or other party about a relevant matter. As you will have all seen in the media, this is often absolutely central to offences like rape, uh, domestic abuse, human trafficking, other forms of exploitation. And now, of course, where once a conversation between two parties uh, would have been forgotten, or partially remembered at best. Now, it's on the record, it's kept forever, might have been published immediately, everybody may know it. Uh, and given that the UK is the most socially networked country in the world, as I understand it, uh, the volumes of both devices and data that may become relevant in our investigations is huge. In London, a lot of our um, investigations will involve people speaking foreign languages on their texts or whatever, and that creates extra complexity. And quite patently, the volumes that we're dealing with are actually not read most effectively by an investigator. They are read most effectively uh, by a machine. But we're not quite there uh, yet. And wading through the data, as our investigators have to do in some quite difficult formats often, takes a huge amount of time and labor. So each of our cases now is taking a lot longer in order to ensure that we discharge our disclosure functions than it would have done just maybe two or three years ago. 
Encryption, of course, is another area of great complexity for us. It makes it harder, more expensive, and sometimes completely impossible for law enforcement to access data. Further challenge comes when passwords are withheld, victims deceased, or where multiple devices are found. And of course, then attribution is difficult. An increasing number of apps, such as banking and photo vaults, now use encryption to protect data at rest, as well as data in transit. And sophisticated and, frankly, not so sophisticated criminals seek to escape discovery and identification and to hide evidence through encryption and use of the dark web. I imagine we can assume that as we all become more uh, living a life where we have devices, you know, I read about people being chipped yesterday or, you know, in our clothes, in our homes, controlling the central heating, the fridge and all this, all of these, as we could, we could imagine, they will all have cheaper, better security built in uh, in the future. And... Uh, you know, the home, I'm not going to go on about this, happy to take a question about it, but as the Home Secretary has said, encryption is not an inherently bad thing, but it does create a shared problem that needs a pragmatic and proportionate response from governments and technology companies. One of the changes that we've seen uh, particularly recently, which brings us more challenges, is of course the speed with which people can communicate and move things for all its wonderful benefits. The internet has massively reduced the time it may take for someone to be groomed or radicalized, for a conspiracy to be created, for enablers such as money or component parts of an IED to be accessed, for lessons to be absorbed by criminals or terrorists for that matter, for new tactics and weapons to be developed, for inspiration to turn into action. It's so much easier and quicker for frustration to turn into harassment, hate crime, or a calling to protest or disorder. For a tiff to turn into an argument to meet for a fight and a murder to take place. For a drug deal to be made and delivered from anywhere to anywhere. This, by definition, speed creates extra pressure on the police to intervene earlier or place people under greater surveillance to manage risk. If we take counter-terrorism, we see the current threat, highly chaotic people. If we do know something about who they are and where they are and what they're doing, then we may have now, because of the speed to which they can go from one thing to the next, we may have to intervene very early and not then end up with the evidence that we would like. So for us, the data problem, if you like, is about volume, yes, it's about complexity, definitely, uh, it's about encryption as part of in, uh, complexity, and it's about speed. And in addition, as you will all be very well aware, new emerging technologies are appearing and being refined all the time. Uh, for example, drones, huge advances in drones, developed for very good use, 99% used for good use, also, as you know, used or have been being used to transport illicit goods into prisons. Autonomous vehicles, robots, and in artificial intelligence will, of course, pose new problems. If a machine kills someone, who should be held to account? How do we have an audit trail that allows the, the, the killer or the responsible party to be identified and brought to justice? Predicting the future is very hard. I know the Victorians predicted underwater cities by now. Um, nobody, I think, predicted the smartphone until they just about arrived. Uh, but one thing is clear for us. You know, we are entering a period of accelerating pace of change, and you scientists and technologists know that better than I do. So how well are the police keeping up? Um, how, how much are we changing? How, how are we becoming more agile for the future? I think you could be forgiven if you read a few recent reports for getting slightly depressed. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily say you all have to go and read it, but the recent Home Affairs Select Committee report made some quite damning comments, um, fairly or unfairly, about where police technology uh, is. I think all us police people in the room would definitely accept uh, that uh, there is, sorry to sound a bit like Sir Humphrey here, there is some more work <laughs> across 43 forces uh, to get our basic architecture, IT architecture, sorted out, to um, you know, deal with our legacy systems, to create 
common standards and uh, resilient and efficient systems. But actually, when I travel uh, and talk to colleagues in other countries, I think we should recognize that, you know, if, if which I don't want us to do, but we go back to my slide of 1983, we had a police national computer then. Yes, you had to ring it up, I remember. And um, it was all very complicated, and, and there were long delays and things. But we had one, and we do still have one. Uh, and it's about to be totally revitalized. Uh, we have a police national database, which is a bit clunky, but does actually allow uh, intelligence to be accessed around the country. We have national biometric systems. We have had for a very long time a national uh, airwave radio, which we all use, and so do other services, uh, covert and overt. We're just about to have a national um, automatic number plate recognition system. And operationally, and I think this is probably as, as important as the, the tech, I hope people will agree, we are extremely interoperable and highly collegiate in this country. Met officers with specialist skills, and indeed not so specialist skills, but let's talk about public order, firearms, surveillance, negotiating, counterterrorism. They go up and down the country and work quite happily anywhere in the country. No problem. Same standards, same doctrine, same training, same kit. Uh, and as chiefs, we tend to have this, a, a shared ethos. The forces have a shared ethos, the same history. We know each other. A lot of us train together. We don't compete. We help. So despite the complexities that there most certainly are of having 43 police services, 43 police crime commissioners, uh, the National Crime Agency, the Home Office, Scotland, Northern Ireland, many others, we are actually remarkably increasingly aligned and collaborative. And some of you will know my colleague, uh, Sarah Thornton, and I went out of policing and came back in, and I came back in and thought, actually, Sarah Thornton is a saint. It is extraordinary how far we had managed to, uh, she's the chair of the National Police Chiefs Council, how much we had managed to come together on, uh, uh, on the technological challenges. And we're all, uh, moving fast to give our frontline people the, the tech support that they need. Let me give you just a couple of quick I examples from the Met. I hope you can read that. Uh, in the Met, in the last year, we rolled out uh, about 22,000 body-worn video. Uh, we've rolled out tablets and laptops uh, for our people to be able to use to keep them out on the ground, uh, faster, easier, more flexible, more present with the public. Body-worn video is an interesting one. It's been a great success. I, haven't, I have not met an officer who doesn't love their body-worn vid video. It was rolled out on time, to budget, tough, easy to use, serves multiple purposes. It gathers evidence at the scene of a domestic violence incident. Uh, it has integrity, of course. It can be uploaded, accessed easily, sent to the CPS and the court uh, in a jiffy. It's increased officer confidence, public confidence, reduced complaints, in increased our legitimacy, uh, standards of investigations uh, undoubtedly have gone up because of it. It's a great tool for learning in teams when things go well and indeed when things go badly. Another example up there is our mobile fingerprinting kit, which we've just recently rolled out. 600 devices on the streets of London, developed within the Met, of course with help, but developed very quickly. Rest assured, we only use it if you are a uh, suspect um, and or in very rare cases of safeguarding. Um, it's working really well. It stops you being arrested when you don't need to be. Uh, if we're unsure about your identity and then we become sure of your identity because of the fingerprint, then you won't uh, normally be, well, you won't be arrested because that's why we're checking probably. The other circumstances in which we might check would be uh, if you are in serious and obvious need of care. And so, so recent, a recent case was somebody who was um, in a psychotic episode. We were able, uh, with, um, uh, you know, we were able to take the fingerprint quite easily and happily, and discovered where the person should actually have been, and he had walked out of, uh, of uh, a mental health uh, crisis place. We're also um, using, uh, unsurprisingly technology hugely, so there's a couple of other things there, but we use it hugely in our engagement with the public. Um, and this is happening very, very fast. And, not, and, and the reason I want to call it out is because we now have um, not only a whole variety of ways in which the public can contact us, can give us information, we can tell them what's going on, they can report things, uh, but I think more usefully in a way, 
um, we have developed a single portal, uh, happens to have started in London, but is now being taken, uh, taken on by uh, 35 forces across the country. So it will be uh, much easier for the public and much cheaper for all of, uh, for all of us to use. Um, we are in the foothills of looking at live facial recognition. We have used facial recognition in the past to uh, identify known suspects against custody images. Uh, and we are now beginning to trial proactively live facial recognition. Um, I'm sure I may get a question on this, but suffice to say, uh, for me, it is one example of the emerging technologies that we need to work out quickly how we can use to best effect in a manner that the public will support. Um, we're taking really baby steps, and I imagine that to move to the next slide, many of you may think that we have been using this for years, because if you watch any television program, it seems as though live facial recognition and similar things are absolutely commonplace in policing and, of course, in the intelligence agencies and beyond, and have been for years and years. I can tell you they're not, and um, if only we had him, it might be different, but it's perfectly clear. I'm not going to debate facial recognition now, but it is perfectly clear that policing needs to make use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics. I think the public would expect us to. For example, in you know, AI in command and control to optimize our dispatching of the right officers to the right emergency call, surely uncontroversial. Using AI to predict demands uh, and crime patterns, probably uncontroversial. But begin when we begin to use it to predict human behaviors, such as the risk of offending or reoffending, then there are not just scientific or security questions that need to be answered, but also significant practical, ethical, and legal questions. And public acceptance of such methods, I guess, is perhaps much more likely in cases of terrorism and serious violence than it would be, say, in antisocial behavior. So we can expect that the public would actually expect the intelligence agencies or the counterterrorism police to be able to sift through, as I said before, all their data, um, probably they can't, but they probably expect, and people might well expect them to, to be able to piece together links between data and individuals. Identifying, for example, indications that an extremist is becoming threatening or angry. As a citizen who spends time online, I know full well that private companies who supply me know a very great deal about my lifestyle. They know my likes, they know my dislikes, they may know even how I'm feeling right now. They send me advertisements. They prompt me based on what I'm likely to want to buy or do or feel next online. Now, some of us may find that a bit creepy. Others don't notice. Many, like me, are more or less grateful for the help I get in my online life. How creepy is it for an intelligence agency to be doing the same thing as the private companies are in the fight against terrorists or hostile actors. How creepy, acceptable or unacceptable, might it be for us to ask the same companies to be able to alert us if a sex offender accesses, accesses a site they've been banned from watching or shows a pattern of online behavior we know suggests they're getting violent. If a private company can do it and it's not too creepy, should we, the police, be able to do it ourselves rather than asking the private company to identify and inform us? In what cases? To prevent what crimes? These are fiendishly complicated areas and they are absolutely not for the police to decide. But as Michael Chertoff said last year in the context of cyber, we currently witness such technologies being used by criminals, hacktivists, bad actors, private sector, whilst those charged with law enforcement lag well behind. Not just because of our technology, but because technology change is outstripping our ability to think about the law and ethics effectively. So back to facial recognition, I am as sure as I can be that in the tiny weeny little trial that we conducted of live facial recognition recently on a street in London, 
where we put in as our sample to be identified 50 of the most violent, dangerous and wanted people who lived in a very small area around. And we told the public that we were coming and we advertised it all and you were told that you didn't have to walk through the scanner and, 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 and. Teeny weeny baby trial, controversial I may say, but nevertheless we're carrying on with them. I am absolutely convinced that within 30 meters of that trial there is a private sector organization which has been using very similar technology for a very long time. Now, um, t'was ever thus to some extent, CCTV uh, was uh, um, similar. But my problem is I don't think we are all thinking about this hard enough. So in that context, I welcome uh, the Rusi report, and I suspect the authors might be in the room, so if you are, well, thank you very much. Because Rusi recently uh, published a report on machine learning algorithms and police decision making, and I do commend it uh, to, to people if they are interested. They highlight uh, the current lack of clear guidance, they note the great potential to do so much more, and they call for a new regulatory framework. They note that legal and eth ethical issues are not just complex, but they're also context dependent. And machine learning algorithms require constant attention and vigilance to ensure the predictions that they're providing are as accurate and unbiased as possible. So I hope you will have gathered, those of you that don't know me, that I believe so strongly that the balance between security and privacy is incredibly important and never for the police to decide where the slider should sit. It needs constant review and careful policing of the boundary. And, and in my view, we have some challenges, as I say, in keeping up. Technology is changing so fast, but we need a firm legal basis for advances that the public would expect. Much of our law is predicated on a pre-internet age. Let me give you a very quick example in the next slide. So this is a case uh, Grant West, he used malware to steal people's identities, sell them to others, and he was paid in bitcoins. We managed to convict him, and indeed, to seize the bitcoins. Quite a big challenge about where do you put the bitcoins. <laughs> Even bigger challenge to help the Crown Prosecution Service and the judiciary, and people like me of course, understand what has gone on here and then, uh, finally, uh, a challenge, actually, to find law that is absolutely, uh, utterly appropriate for that. Uh, for, for that. Nevertheless, he's, he's convicted and the assets are, are seized. The second challenge, and I've mentioned it twice already, is the oversight and regulatory processes are confused. And inevitably, anybody, with no disrespect to Sir Tom Winston, the HMI, chief HMI who is here for policing and fire, um, inevitably, people, less so perhaps in, in inspectorates, but people who are engaged in oversight and regulation tend to be in the business primarily of pointing out what you can't do rather than enabling you to do. And that is their job in many respects. But in that case of confused regulation and not enough being helped with the enabling, what we need is lots of debate, we need lots of leadership, and we need policy to fill, at the moment, I think, a slight vacuum. New technologies are disrupting all our social norms. Data is now rem very um, remotely held, and, it, and when it is, it is actually very, very, very open f frequently. And it's way beyond the individual's technical possession, up in the cloud. But our attitudes to privacy and the delineation between public and private is, sh is shifting very fast. And if I ask my young and not so young, frankly, officers to undertake an inquiry, their initial human response might well be to reach for their smartphone, to look at an app. But they have to pause. <laughs> they have to remember that they are pursuing a policing purpose and apply law designed long ago to protect the so-called private spaces in people's lives, which if they were doing it for their own personal purposes, they'd probably find in a second in an app. This may in fact be the right place for us to be. I am prepared to accept that. None of us wants to be in a police state. 
as a citizen, I am appalled at the thought of the intrusion that happens somewhere in some other parts of the world. But I ask for a louder debate. I also recognize that we, the police, need to get better at explaining ourselves, and we need to get better at talking with the, with the public about the dilemmas. But it's not a job for the police alone. So I welcome, Ruthie, I welcome bodies such as we, we have a Met Ethics Committee, the Turing Institute, Tech UK, Institute of Data Ethics, a number of bodies, and, and indeed the, the private sector, from finance to tech to social media, want to help us in all kinds of ways and with the debate. And of course, so do want to help us because we're citizens, the civil liberties groups. They want to help us to be in the right place. And I'm, I'm hoping that we will have a greater level of political attention and widespread public debate. Because we all have a responsibility to prevent crime, as Sir Robert Peel said in 1829. We have a responsibility to support and ensure our police are properly equipped and enabled to adopt new, pra new practices at pace. And we all have a responsibility to ensure the police do not become too powerful or too intrusive. I'm incredibly proud to be the current Commissioner of the Met in this great global city. It's a welcoming home to tech companies, uh, large and small, to so many wonderful science and technological uh, education, thought, research institutions to this great university. The future wealth of our city depends on us all keeping you safe, us police people in the room and our colleagues, keeping you safe and feeling you, <coughs> you in the private sector, you in, uh, in the education and research world, feeling that this is a good place to live, a good safe place to live and to invest. Our police future effectiveness depends on us, I say, cherishing our core values, prizing our human interactions and our human decision-making. It depends also, though, on us embracing new technologies, making the most of the data we have and not drowning in it. And to do that, we have to strengthen even further our co-working with other police services, as I've said, with the intelligence agencies, with government and with local partners interesting, I am finishing, I promise you, to look back to 2017 and all the horror of 2017, the absolutely um, excoriatingly honest reviews conducted by counter-terrorist policing and the intelligence agencies about what happened and what we collectively knew about the people who carried out the terrorist attacks. Overseen by David Anderson, a in totally independent person whose report some of you will have read, and the two big chunks of things he talks about in that that need to be improved for the future are number one, the ability for the agencies and the police to integrate and really work with their data even better, and secondly, the ability of the agencies and the police to work with people in local areas, in local authorities, in education and schools and others to manage the risk posed by people who might be extremists becoming violent extremists or people who were violent extremists who are perhaps, we know not what they're doing right now. These are two enormous <laughs> challenges for us and we are setting off down that road. So that's one example of the even further better partnerships that we need to have and I will always argue that in the last 10 years it has been the case there is no better partnership in counter-terrorism than that between the British agencies and intelligence agencies and our police but equally we need other partnerships we need research and development we need kit as you've heard we need advice we need help we need an enabling environment uh, we need a lively debate that leads to fast clarity, which I appreciate will never stand still, but fast clarity about what it's okay and not okay for us to do as a 21st century police service in our de democracy as we use emerging technologies. Thank you very much indeed.